Amen. Thanks, Cameron. Pastor John, don't hear that very often, but I appreciate it. And I uh, love that lyric. You're here, moving in this place. God, you're here, working in this place. And I think it's an especially important lyric right now because you guys are all in your places and yet you can hear and you can be confident that God is at work in all those places just as he's at work right here. It is so good to, I guess not see you, but be seen by you this morning. And as I'm pretty sure you know, the stay-at-home order in Georgia expired on Friday. And though strict social distancing remains strongly recommended for groups of 10 or more. And so lots of people all around the state are working out what that means for them specifically. For us here at Grace, it means we're going to continue our online gatherings and worship rhythms that we've been maintaining these last few weeks through at least May 24th. As we discuss this issue with our elders, we recognize there are a lot of unknowns and our congregation is very diverse, young to old. And you know, it's just going to be hard to explain social distancing to a four-year-old, much less ask one of our nursery volunteers to enforce that social distancing. And so because of the unknowns, because of the potential risk, we will be continuing online at least through the majority of the month of May. And this is a continuation of our day-to-day, week-to-week pattern of following God. And this is a disruption for all of us. This is a disruption in our everyday lives. Disruption is uncomfortable, but it also extends to us the opportunity to maybe reset some things that may have gotten out of whack in our lives. And for guidance in that reset, we are walking with the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt toward the covenant at Sinai. And remember, last week we were reading, God led them to a dead end on the shores of the Red Sea. And this wasn't really a problem until Pharaoh, their former slave master, the wicked king of Egypt, decided to chase down these families on foot with his best chariots and soldiers. And it's a crisis because they all are sure they're either going to die or be carried back to Egypt. But as we saw last week, three times in that passage, God reminds Moses and the people that he's brought them to this dead end in order to get glory over Pharaoh and his armies and so that all of Egypt will know that he is the Lord. And this was the first and most fundamental reset we discussed last week. God is more concerned with his glory than our immediate relief. But then, on the other side of the shores of the Red Sea, we find a second reset. God gets glory when we get grace. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Exodus 14. And we're going to reset the scene for you with a little help, once again, from that film, Prince of Egypt. And we're picking up right as the people cross over, Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Now, Grace, folks, imagine yourself in that situation on that day. Think about the intense range of emotions in a moment going from the terror that you were hopelessly trapped to the wonder of walking in the way of God's salvation. Would you speak? Would you be silent? Would you hurry through? 
Would you slow down? How would passing through the sea change you? How would that walk change the way you know God? We pick it up in verse 23. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. This is, this is the key moment. This is when the Egyptians recognize God is against them and that they are not the ultimate power they thought they were. Remember, Three times in chapter 14 already, God said, I will get glory over Pharaoh and his armies and all Egypt will know that I am the Lord. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Imagine now, on the far side of the Red Sea, having witnessed this phenomenal display of God's grace toward his people. They were stuck. They couldn't save themselves. And God makes a way where there was no way. God moves through Moses, a mediator. God completely overthrows the enemy. This is grace displayed like a rainbow through a prism. And I could give you a definition for the word grace. B.B. Warfield says it's the free sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. John Stott says grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. I could give you the bumper sticker version of the grace definition. Mercy, not merit. But this is actually a really good picture of grace. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. In fact, this story, this picture at the Red Sea, it becomes the major image for salvation through the rest of the Bible until even Jesus' own life, death, and resurrection, which is described in Luke chapter 9 as Jesus' sort of ultimate exodus. The Bible's words for salvation Redeem, deliver, ransom, purchase, freedom. They all draw richly from this story. And remember, all of this, the deliverance through the Red Sea, the departure from Egypt, it all happens before God gives the Ten Commandments. Just to be sure that everyone knows God's deliverance does not depend on Israel's performance or obedience of commands. This is the grace reset. God gets glory when we get grace. And right here, the people, they get it. Look what happens on the far side of the sea. In verse one of chapter 15, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war or a mighty warrior. The Lord is his name. 
Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind in the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. This song, if you're paying attention, tells us what God has done triumphed, thrown horse and rider and chariot into the sea. This song also tells us what the enemy wanted to do, pursue, overtake, destroy. And we also find in this song what the redeemed do. Sing, praise, and exalt. Because when you get grace, you praise When you realize how God saves us, you sing. See, the Egyptians, they're all about making it happen in their own strength, in their own power, in their own might. But the redeemed on the other side of the Red Sea, they realize only God can save them. And it's personal. If you notice, this is not a song about God This is a song to God. Verse 12, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble, pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. And so in their worship, you can see how they're bringing together the grace that God has demonstrated in the past with the grace that God will show them in the future. I mean, they're already confidently leaning into the promises that God will bring them to the promised land. And this song, this song of Moses, it's sort of like the Bible's equivalent of our national anthem. Now, I remember... Growing up, I played probably hundreds, maybe thousands of baseball games from T-ball to Little League all the way up through college. And at the beginning of every single game, all those times, we would stand addressing the American flag or be in our positions or we'd be you know, getting ready to bat, we'd be on the bench, whatever it was, we'd find the American flag and we would address it, hat off, And then someone somewhere would push play on a cassette recording and you would hear the tinny sound of that beautiful song. Oh, say can you see? And and you'd feel it in your heart. I mean, maybe some of you, when I started to sing, you kind of felt like, oh, I need to stand up. I mean, it's like default for us to stand up. And when we sing that song, there's like an essence of our nation, that sort of patriotic swell that comes with it. We, we sort of get our country. And you remember the story of its composition. It goes back to the War of 1812 when Francis Scott Key was observing the bombardment of Fort McHenry by the British. And all night long, rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air. The question, did the fort fall in the night? And then when the sun rose, he saw that 
stars and stripes flag still snapping in the dawn breeze. The fort hadn't fallen. And so when we sing that song, we connect with the grit and the victory, the perseverance and patriotism of what it means to be American. That's our national anthem. But this song of Moses, this is the song of the redeemed through the Bible. And in the same way, when we sing this song, we begin to get grace. In fact, when this song is sung in the synagogues, the Jewish community today, it's one of only two passages in the entire Torah that causes the people to stand when it's read. It's the Ten Commandments. They stand for the Ten Commandments, and they stand for this one. This song shows up elsewhere in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 12, we find that there Isaiah prophesies, oh yeah, there's Francis Scott Key, that the people after judgment, when they're brought back to the land, will sing these same lyrics, God is my salvation, the Lord God is my strength and my song, he's become my salvation. This song appears also in Revelation chapter 15, where all those who overcome the beast, it says, sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. They say, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. See this song, and singing this song, that gives us a picture of God's grace, and it centers us on the reality of God's grace. And we need that. We really need that. Because at the core of our relationship with God is this beautiful but really challenging action of God's grace. And the reason that God's grace acting in our lives is challenging is because we don't like to admit what we cannot do. It's hard sometimes for us to really receive grace because we want to justify ourselves. We want to save ourselves. We want to prove ourselves. We want to be the heroes of our own stories. It's pride, really, that prevents us from getting grace on a daily basis. Just this week, we had a conversation with a family from the church, and they expressed some needs financially because of the COVID crisis. And so our team got together, figured out how we might provide some assistance. When we came back and said, hey, I think this is what we can do, they said, actually, no, we don't want it. Because it's just so hard to admit that you're in need. Similar story, a few weeks ago, another family that's been very financially stable for years and years suddenly is coming on some hard times because of, because of this financial and health crisis. And we said, how can we help you? And they said, it's just so disorienting to go from being the ones with surplus to be able to be generous to now admitting that we have a need. Grace is hard for us to grasp. And sometimes we can be prideful in a different way. We can sink so far down in our view of ourselves, so far down in the dumps that we think that God won't or shouldn't show us grace. But even that is kind of an upside down pride because we're telling God who does and doesn't deserve grace. The book of Galatians is all about this issue. Paul, right off at the beginning, the sixth verse of the book says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ and are now turning to a different gospel. See, the people in Galatians, they're okay with salvation being by grace, but now they're starting to add in some other stuff where they can earn it, where they can do it themselves and obligate God to serve and work and redeem and save in their lives. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the very famous preacher in the 20th century in the UK, he would ask this question of people to find out where they were in their faith. He would say, sir, are you a Christian? And he talked about how in Britain people are generally a little bit more humble. And he said often he would ask them that question, sir, are you a Christian? And they would reply like this, they would say, I'm trying. I'm trying to be. Now, 
I don't know if you catch the problem with that response. And I don't mean to be all Yoda with you, but when it comes to grace, there is no try. You either trust the grace of God in Jesus Christ is sufficient, or you don't. You either walk in the way that God has made for our salvation, splitting the Red Sea, or you go in with all your own intentions trying to figure things out. But when it clicks that God loves you because he loves you because he loves you, when it clicks that God is not looking for you to perform in order to merit his reward. When you understand that God brings the people through the Red Sea, not because of anything that they've done, but because of his love, when that begins to click, worship erupts. Freedom is unleashed. When God saves, we sing. That's what we see here in Exodus 15. When we get grace, God gets the glory. So in verse 20, Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Did you know that in the Hebrew Bible there are 10 different words describing dance? Three of them mean to dance in a circle or, or spin. There's like a dervishy one. There's another one that's kind of a big group dance. Another two of them mean skip, which is kind of a fun way to dance. And there's another one that just means jump. But all of these are the physical embodiment of what happens when we get grace. It's not just a thing that happens in your head. It's not just something that you kind of feel like, ah, oh, that's so nice. When you get grace, it erupts through your body. Miriam dances. And I bet if you were on that Red Sea on the other shore, you would have grabbed a tambourine too and danced. When was the last time you danced thinking about the grace of God? When was the last time your heart erupted in song because you got grace for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that we would not perish but believe in him and have fulfilling, sustained, eternal life that Jesus dies on the cross so that we could be redeemed. This is the foundation of our faith. Reset number two, do we get grace? I was um, reading this this week and I actually, and I want to invite the band up here because we're going to do just a little bit more in Exodus 15, but before we do, I just want to stop here and give all of us an opportunity to respond to grace. But I was, I was just, I was dancing this week with my girls who put on some worship music and they are so good at dancing. It's so innocent, it's so pure. And I'm watching them dance and there is a freedom as they sing the words and they spin around and they jump. It's like they don't have to know the Hebrew words. They just intuitively know when they're joyful, when they're free, they know how to dance. Now for me, freedom and dance don't usually go together. Every high school, middle school dance I ever went to, I was terrified about who's watching me and what steps do I do. And I don't feel comfortable wearing this suit or this tuxedo. I mean, dance for me was never something that felt free. But as I'm reading this passage, I'm just... I feel challenged by the scriptures. I feel challenged about my heart really delighting in the grace of God in a fresh way. And you know, this whole corona thing has been almost overwhelming. It just pushes the situation in front of you so much. There's so many questions, so many unknowns, so many things to be afraid of, so many new challenges you face at home and everything else. It's just so in front of you that it's easy to lose sight of your salvation because of the closeness of the situation. But as I've been reading Exodus 15 this week, I'm just hearing 
the songs of the saints that they've been singing like an anthem for generations. The song that we're gonna sing in eternity after we've overcome all the enemies. I'm going, man, Lord, remind me the joy of my salvation. Remind me of what it means that my sins are forgiven, that I was in a dead end and I couldn't save myself and you came through. You made a way, you've overcome my enemies. Lord, remind me of that goodness of grace that fills our lives. And and Lord, when I get grace, may you get glory. So let's just for a moment, where you are, um, if you get grace, sing. It's one of the questions we have doing this online. Are you actually singing at home? (laughs) I want to ask you to sing wherever you are and maybe dance a little bit. I mean, you're not even in a room with 500 other people who can see you. Maybe you're in your PJs or whatever else. Get up and skip, hop, maybe spin. Rejoice in the freedom of God's grace. I've had the privilege of leading worship at Kids Life this year. And I want to tell you, this is one of our favorites. When we sing this song, the kids just come alive. They get off their feet, they're moving, and we want you to join us. We've got rivers of living water that are welling up within us. Jesus said that all who come to him should not be thirsty. But these rivers of living water will flow and flow and flow. There's no end to their source. So come on, gather your kids, jump up and down. Here we go. I've got a river of living water, a fountain that never will run dry. It's an open heaven, your release we will never be denied. John, he's going to get down with us. I love it. Now, this is the fun part. This is where the river moves around, and we've got to move with the river. Are you ready? It goes like this. Now, if it goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. And if it goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're going to jump, 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 jump in the river. Jump, 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 everybody. If it goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. And if it goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. In the river, dance, 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 everybody. If it goes to the left, then we go to the left. If it goes to the right, then we go to the right. We're gonna jump, 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 every river. Jump, 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 everybody. If it goes to the left, then we go to the left. And if it goes to the right, then we go to the right. We're gonna shout, 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 everybody. Shout, 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 shout. Deep cries out to you, deep cries out, deep cries out, deep cries out. 
for jump, jump, jumping in the river with us. Amen. You may be seated now. Oh, that was fun here. I hope it was fun there as you get grace. Now, I realize that some of you may not get grace. For some of you, that was a little silly. Maybe for some of you, it just didn't connect with you. And there's lots of reasons for that. Lots of reasons for that. Some of you may still be figuring out what this God thing is all about. Some of you may be in hard places where dancing just does not seem to be appropriate for what you're going through. But here's what I would remind you. All those people going through the Red Sea had different things going on in their lives. They'd just been uprooted from their place. They're on a journey where they don't really know the destination. And yet, they passed through. They experienced that grace. And they sang on the other side. And if you know Jesus, if you trust Jesus has died for your sins and resurrected to offer you eternal life, then no matter whether it feels like you're on one side of the Red Sea or the other, that grace of God is alive and at work in your life. And if it's something that just doesn't spark yet, I encourage you, come back and read this song, sing this song, maybe even dance a little bit. But the question does remain, because grace for Israel meant judgment for Egypt. And so this grace that we get, it's costly. It's extremely costly to the Egyptians. And even the words that they sing on the far side in the Song of Moses, the Lord, a man of war, the Lord, a mighty warrior, it's a reminder that God is gracious, but God is not to be trifled with. God is unfathomably merciful and loving and at the same time fully committed to justice and righteousness. And so the question begins to emerge as we get grace. How do we continue to walk relying on that grace of God? And that's where this second story in Exodus 15 comes. It's a very short story. It's a very simple application. I'm going to read it for you and we're going to sing one more song. Verse 22, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Wow. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. That's what the name Marah means, bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. There it is the path forward to walk in grace. The words are interesting. It says in verse 25, the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And he uses the word commandment in the next verse. And it's clear that God is speaking of revelation. He's speaking about his word working in people's lives. Commandments, statutes. So here's the other half. We just saw in the Song of Moses worship as the people get grace. And here now, God is saying, I'll also give you my word. Worship and word. Word and worship, revelation and response. These are the two focal points of a life lived in grace. If it's all word with no worship, 
you can begin to get puffed up in knowledge because you just are accumulating all these ideas from the scriptures. If it's all worship with no word, who knows where you'll end up? It's just a, an emotional cloud. <laughs> But when there's word and there's worship, like we see here in Exodus 15, there's no threat, there's no drought, there's no illness that can overcome God's gracious people because they're just anchored. They're orbiting worship and the word. In fact, one last little thing. Some of you maybe are in geometry right now doing some digital learning at home and you are learning about the ellipse. The ellipse is not a circle, it's actually more of an oval. And if you recall, an ellipse is made around two focus points, or foci, you know, because it's plural. And so if you wanna draw a perfect ellipse, you get your two anchor points like that, and then you take your pencil and you rotate it around. And I thought, this is such a beautiful picture of what it means to be a redeemed, grace-filled person. Because it means that we, our lives, they orbit around worship and the word. Worship and the word. Worship and the word. And the definition of that line that forms the ellipse is that the sum of the distance between the two focal points is always the same. And so constantly our lives are lived in tension and balance around worship and the word. It's been one of the challenges of our disruption here on these Sunday mornings, our regular rhythms of worship and the word and community. They aren't happening quite the same way, but you and your homes, we're rediscovering new rhythms. And even though we're in our homes, even though we're online, even though we're doing Zoom calls, even though all the rest is just not quite normal, we can keep orbiting the worship of the gracious God and the trustworthy word of the gracious God. Because here in Exodus 15, God gives them the pattern. God doesn't give them all the laws here. He doesn't give them all the statutes, the commandments. God just says, hey, if you stay close to my word, you're gonna know me as your healer. You've seen me as your mighty, gracious deliverer at the Red Sea. Keep walking in my word, and you will know me as your healer. We need deliverance, and we need healing. We need salvation and we need restoration. We need God's grace to get us out of the dead end and get us whole. And not just us, but the people around us, our country. We need this. Let's orbit around worship and the word. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for the reset moment you brought Israel through. And we ask God that you'd lead us in our reset moments as well. So every place in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our rhythms, in our routines that just need to be tweaked out of that place of I could do it, I'm striving, I've got to maintain anxiety. They need to be tweaked out of that into the place where we're leaning on your grace, Lord. Would you just do that now? And Lord, I, I pray for us as we interact with your word, that your word would speak to us and that we would know you as the healer as we interact with your word. And Lord, we pray that you would heal and you would deliver. And I pray for people even this morning who are watching who may not fully trust you, who haven't taken your salvation, that they would turn to you and simply say, yes, Lord, I, I trust your work, Jesus. I cannot save myself in this dead end from the enemy that pursues me. That I cannot fix my sin in my own power. And so all I can do is say yes to you, Lord Jesus. I surrender and I give to you the responsibility to bear the judgment for my sin that I might live in grace. Lord, I just pray faith would arise faith would emerge faith would spring up and deepen our faith in Jesus name Lord let us know you let us know you as our healer